There are many different ways and techniques to build and prepare an artist's canvas based on different needs and experience levels. This video will overview the construction of the frame using power tools, hand tools, and pre-made stretchers. Also, we will demonstrate canvas stretching and priming with Jessa. Pardon me, Michael. Oh, hey, guys. We will take it from here. Yes, there you go. Zoom in on me. I feel it now. Welcome to the true and classical way to build a canvas. What's that, Scully? What limitations? I am the ideal. Behold, in all of my glory. Now, all I need is the proper tools. These will have to do. Prepare for the classical approach in canvas making. Uh, no, no worries, I can fix that. <laughs> okay, okay, I just have to pick that up. Scully, do not worry. I've been classically trained. Focus. Think, Hermes. I just need a moment to collect myself. To regain perfection. Uh, good luck with the video. Okay. In this video, we will take a look at three different common constructions. First, let's go over how to build a canvas using power tools. Using two adjoined one inch by two inch wooden boards, the construction of the wooden stretcher bars, and the assembly of the frame. For small and medium sized canvases, a one by two board can create the perfect frame. Before joining the two boards together, using a table saw angled from 30 degrees to 45 degrees, let's strip down one board to create a beveled edge in aid of stretching the fabric canvas. When picking out your boards for purchase, please make sure your boards are straight and even. Place the beveled edge board to the outside of the support 1x2. Using good wood glue and clamps, let's adhere the boards together. Apply a thin coat of wood glue spread evenly with a brush down the whole length of the board. To hold them in place, clamp the boards together, one clamp on each end. I am using two 8-foot sections of 1x2. Using inch and a quarter wood nails, start in the center, hammering toward each end. Working outwards will ensure that the boards are joined evenly together. Nails should be no further than 6 inches apart to properly hold the boards in place to allow the glue to dry. Using a miter saw, now let's cut our 45 degree angled cuts for our corners. I am making a 24 by 18 canvas frame. And make sure you always follow the carpenter's golden rule. Measure twice, cut once. Just like before, and when using any power saw, make sure you follow all safety guidelines and wear protective goggles. I would encourage you to wear a dust mask as well. Right, Scully? Align your paired sets back to back to ensure that they are even and accurate. Using two 45 degree cuts, we are able to make sure we have a perfect 90 degree corner. And that's about as good as my math gets. Now let's create some triangles made of a hardboard or thin plywood to make a cross cut joint brace. To ensure your braces have enough strength, make sure they're at least 3 16 of an inch thick to 1 quarter of an inch. To cut down your hardboard, you could either use a bandsaw or a jigsaw to make those great precision cuts. Mine are 8 inch by 5 inch by 5 inch. Double check that your triangle brace easily crosses over the joint to ensure strength. The larger the triangle, the stronger the joint. Using a corner clamp really makes simple work of creating a strong and accurate 90 degree joint. We will use a brad nailer and wood glue to attach our hardboard triangle braces. Using a brush, apply the glue thinly and evenly to the open joint. A thin application of wood glue is way stronger than thicker glue. Afterwards, leave your glue brush in a cup of water so we can reuse it later. Time for the corner braces. Place each section in the brace one at a time so that they align flush. You want to make sure there's plenty of surface contact in the joint. That's where the strength comes from. Once aligned, tighten corners. If it is your first time building a frame, glue each corner as you apply the brace. Otherwise, the glue may dry before you even apply the brace. Do take your time aligning the corners properly. Canvas stretching is very hard on the corners and joints. After clamping all the corners, double check that all the braces are tight and aligned. 
Then flip over the frame, check the back for alignment. Sometimes small adjustments are necessary, and rubber mallets are always perfect for small adjustments. Am I right, Scully? Now it's time to apply the triangle braces. Again, using a brush, apply a thin layer of glue to both the frame and the triangle. Place the triangle on top of the inner 1x2. Once in position, hammer in several small finishing nails, 5 8 to 1 inch. For our size of triangle brace, five nails should be enough to hold it in place. Basically one nail for every two to three inches. Finally, tap the nails with a hammer to make sure that they're flush. You don't want them sticking out and possibly snagging or ripping your canvas. Repeat the process for all three remaining corners. Remember, good surface contact and the glue is what gives the joint its strength. The nails are there to apply pressure and hold the pieces in place as the glue dries. Personally, building my own canvases helps me connect with the piece. A synergy, if you will, to which I'm part of most of the processes of creation. A painting is not just an image, it's an object. And building my own frames helps remind me of that. After getting all the triangle braces in place and secure, it is time to fasten the outer corners. Flip the frame on its edge and nail through the 45 degree cut, pinning both corners. The cross anchors will ensure the outer corners have good surface connection to allow the glue to do its job. Repeat process on the three remaining corners. A one inch to inch and a half finishing nail or wood screw will do the trick. <laughs> After the glue dries, it is time to sand. We will be using 100 grit sandpaper. The lower the grit, the more coarse the sandpaper. With the sandpaper, go around the whole surface, especially what comes in contact with the canvas. Top of the bevel, all four corners, and the entire back edge of the frame. We are looking for a semi-smooth edge and no rough areas. Finally, check all the joints and edges one last time. Then it's ready for canvas. Michael, the Academy has told me to inform you that they are unsure of your construction methods and to stress that we built the finest structures without power tools. So please, Michael, show them how to use hand tools now. Well, I wouldn't want to upset the Academy. Without the aid of a table saw, we will need a piece of pre-milled quarter round to give us that beveled edge, glued and nailed to another one by two board. Either half inch or three quarter inch quarter round creates a great rounded beveled edge. And the best part is you don't have to mill it. To fix the boards together again, we will glue and nail, same procedures as before. And just like before, I am joining eight foot sections together. Remember to nail every five to six inches with either the brad nailer or your hammer and one inch finishing nails. Sticking with our hand tool theme, a miter box saw will help us make those perfect 45 degree angled corners for our canvas frame. Oh, okay, oh, uh, Scully, the blade is dull. I... There we go, it won't take long now. Let's go! <laughs> I've almost got it! <laughs> Hold on! Hold on! <laughs> well, a miter box saw with a sharp blade really does make quick work out of those corners, so do keep your blade sharp. Now let's assemble the frame. Again, following the same techniques as before, apply a thin coat of glue to your corners. Set and brace using a corner clamp. Once all four corners are glued and clamped, then we can apply our wooden triangle braces again. That's right, you guessed it. First, apply a thin layer of glue, and then nail the pieces together with a 5 8 inch or 1 inch finishing nail. Now repeat three more times. So you don't have a bandsaw or a jigsaw to cut your corner braces. Not to worry, you can buy any number of metal L brackets to affix to your boards. Finally, pin the corners together with a 1 inch or 1 and a half inch wood nail or screw. Now let's sand. That's right, I almost forgot. Once dry, then sand. The beveled edges, your corners, and along the back edge. Done. And finally, if you have no tools at all, there are pre-made stretcher bars that can be purchased at virtually any arts and crafts store. They come pre-cut to the size that you need with an outered beveled edge, a built-in tongue and groove system to fasten the corners. As earlier, 
When picking out your 1x2s, make sure you cite your pre-made stretcher bars. Scully found us a how-to video, let's take a look. What was that? Where did you find that? Was that Comic Sans? Strange. Okay, back to the assembly. The corners interlock like so. They are made to fit tightly and securely. I would avoid buying any that just easily fit together. Before gluing and securing the pre-made stretchers, take a moment and make sure that everything fits together. All pre-made stretcher bars have beveled sides. These thicker museum bars, meant for larger works, only have bevels on one side, while these thinner stretcher bars, also known as gallery bars, have beveled edges on both sides. Always double check that the bevels are on the same side and the corners are properly aligned. When assembling the bars, we just need to add a bit of glue to the tongue of the joint on all sections. This is why you want tight fitting together corners on your stretcher bars to make sure you have enough surface area and good surface contact to hold the bars in place to survive stretching. Fit all the corners together at the same time so that you can make your corrections and alignments much more effectively. Using a rubber mallet, gently tap the corners into position, keeping the corner aligned as best as possible. Speaking of, not every manufacturer does a good job of making 90 degree corners, so you will definitely need to double check. The best way is using a triangle square ruler to check those alignments and the individual 90 degree corners. But be creative. You can use any other 90 degree angle, like a tabletop, a countertop, a door frame, etc. And when something's slightly off, adjust it accordingly. As mentioned earlier, a metal door frame is very helpful to finding a 90 degree angle. Use either a staple gun with at least a 5 16 inch staple or a brad nailer to pin and hold the joints of the pre-made bars. Simply just to set one staple or small nail in each corner and that'll do the trick. Double check and make sure they're flush. You're right, Scully, now it's time for canvas. Commercially, there are two major divisions in artist canvas. There is linen canvas, and there's also cotton duck. Canvases also come two different ways. There's unprimed canvas, and there's also primed canvas. Primed canvas just simply means it's already covered with multiple coats of primer, which protects the canvas from your paints and creates a consistent, paintable surface. Personally, I don't recommend a beginner stretching a primed canvas, especially across larger frames. Primed canvas is already quite rigid and has lost a lot of its flexibility, and it is difficult to stretch successfully. Unprimed canvas, on the other hand, is much easier to stretch and is usually much cheaper than primed canvas. Let's start with cotton duck, also known as duck canvas. Cotton duck is a heavy, plain, woven cotton fabric that can produce decent rigidity while still maintaining its flexibility. Cotton duck canvas ranges from 7 ounces to around 18 ounces normally, from very thin to very thick. The heavier the canvas, the more durable the canvas. Thus, heavier canvases are usually reserved for larger paintings, and lighter canvases reserved for smaller paintings. A 10 to 12 ounce canvas is a good universal weight. It's good for both small and large canvases. Now let's talk about linen canvas. Linen canvas, being made from flax, has a mystique and lore from the rich traditions of the European old masters for its superior quality and durability that aids in its prestige. Because of its fibers and its processing, linen is typically much more expensive. It's more durable and it has more strength to it. It's typically better for larger paintings and it has a wonderful synergy with rabbit skin glue to create a very strong and rigid surface. But just like cotton canvas, there are smooth to rough finishes there is also thinner and lighter and thicker and heavier. The smooth finish linen is typically referred to as portrait linen, which is easier to create a glass-like smooth finish for better details and better control. Being expensive and difficult to stretch, I do not recommend linen for a beginner. Plus, linen functions best with the old traditional techniques, rabbit skin glue and an oil primer. It just doesn't have the same synergy with a modern day acrylic based gesso. So, for the beginner, I recommend a cotton duck. It's cheaper, 
it's easier to stretch, and it works so much better with an acrylic-based gesso primer. So let's take our 10 ounce cotton canvas and let's get to stretching. How much canvas do we need for stretching? Well, at minimum, we need enough to cover the frame, in addition to be able to wrap around the back of the width of the stretcher bar. The more we have wrapping around the back, the more torque we can achieve while stretching. Double check and make sure the bevel is facing down toward the canvas. Again, this is how we get our torque, but also this helps prevent a paint buildup along the edges. Now let's rip down the correct length of canvas, starting with a simple incision from some shears and then ripping along the fiber. When stapling, we will work from the inside out, alternating sides. This aids in the creation of a tight, rigid stretch and it should prevent the twisting of the canvas. At minimum, I recommend a 5 16 inch staple, especially when working with heavier, thicker canvases. On the first side, start by gently folding over the canvas. Sink two staples about an inch to an inch and a half apart. Let's head to the opposite side. Now this stretch is the most important and the hardest. You'll want to stretch as tight as you can without tearing the canvas or bowing the frame. To create enough torque, use your thumb and index fingers pinching the canvas so that you can pull properly. At the same time, with your middle, ring, and pinky fingers, push off the stretcher bars. Pull out and away from center toward each side. This will help prevent you from creating valleys and dips along the edges. While holding the tension with one hand, let's sink two more staples directly across from the first set. If you've pulled with sufficient torque and pressure, you should have two canvas hills, each one running the length of the canvas between the staples. Now rotate toward an unpinned side. Pull this side firmly, but do not overstretch enough to barely flatten both of the canvas hills. If you overstretch, the canvas might begin to twist. Again, hold the pressure and sink two staples in the center about an inch apart. Flip around toward that opposite side, and just like before, the second stretch of the pairing needs to be as tight as you can get it without tearing the canvas or bowing the frame. Again, set in place with two staples, starting in the center, about an inch apart. At this point, check your work and the rigidity of the canvas. By giving it a few light taps, it should at least sound like a bass drum. If not, you have to remove the staples and start again. If you need more hand strength or the ability to create more torque, you can use a pair of canvas pliers. On the base of the plier is a pivot bar. Double up the canvas to prevent tearing and grip with the right amount of slack so that it's taut as you hook the canvas bar onto the pivot point. Leverage the pliers down and then staple. Continue to work around the frame, stapling further from the center on either side. Remember to always pull out and away from the center. Staples should always be around a half an inch to one inch apart. To maintain the proper tension. And always work in opposite pairs to avoid the canvas twisting. And just like building the frame, stretching canvas helps immediately connect you to the object. With elements of carpentry, chemistry, color, drawing, and sculpture, painting is a complete medium and a powerful tool of expression. Periodically check in on the rigidity. The drum sound should continually sound higher in pitch the closer you get to finishing. When stretching, do take your time and slowly grip and build up the tension per section. Consistent tension is key to making an even canvas. As you approach the corners, know what sides will be your top and bottom. You will want to leave the last two to three inches unstapled and open so that we can properly fold our corners. To create a clean side of the frame, we will need to staple both our left and right sides the entire length. And don't forget to check in on that rigidity. Drumming is a lot of fun. You know my dad was a drummer, right? I got the rhythm inside me. Michael, 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 I beg of you to stop. Please stop. Stop it! Yikes. You should do something more productive. Like show everyone how to remove staples. If you need to remove your staples, a flathead screwdriver or needle nose pliers are really the best. Carefully slip the flathead underneath the staple and wiggle it until it pops out. If the staple is stubborn, then the needle nose pliers can help. Like I was saying earlier, staple the left and right sides all the way to the end. This will help us create a side that's clean and neat when on display. Before creating our corners, check for dips or valleys along the edge. When stapling the canvas toward the end, 
Make sure you continue to pull the canvas out forward and away from the center to avoid any low areas. Again, leave two to three inches on the top and bottom for each corner so that it gives us the necessary room to fold our corners. If your staples don't sit flush, lightly tap with a hammer. Now let's demonstrate how to make a corner. We will be making hospital corners. Let's start with a proper corner already folded and then work backwards. With the top or bottom of the canvas facing you, pull the fabric away from the sides. Then rotate the fabric in on itself from the outside to the inside and then fold over. Again, pull the fabric off of the sides, pinch and rotate it in on itself. If you are doing it properly, it will leave an extra wedge of fabric that needs to be stapled down first. Once stapled, remove the extra fabric. This will help cut back on the bulk so the corner can be more flat and flush. Then pull tight and fold the corner over. Hold with pressure, then staple into place. From the outside in, stretch and staple back to join the initial staples. You want the corners clean and even to the edge, with no dips, divots, or dividends. Nonsensical alliteration is some mild fun. Repeat this process three more times. Staple the extra flap, cut away all the excess fabric, pull tight, fold over, staple and hold, and then staple back to your original staples. Like all things, it takes a little while to get good at creating clean and neat hospital corners. But stick with it. The end result is far worth it. Constructing your canvas like your artwork with care and a deliberate intent communicates a passion and a craft to your audience and to yourself. Personally, I do work a little bit harder on my paintings when I am proud of the surface I'm working on. Cut away excess fabric so the canvas can be displayed easier and rest flatter on a wall. Finally, one last check for any dips or low spots along the edge. If you feel one, it's mostly because the staples are too far apart on the back. Simply re-stretch and pin the voids, and that should do the trick. Let's start with an overview. There are acrylic and oil-based artist primers, also referred to as a ground. A primer is meant to seal and protect your canvas or fabric substrate and to help create a consistent, even surface. Artist grade, water-based acrylic gesso is the most user-friendly and it's the most universal. Because of its ease of application and easy cleanup, I recommend it for all beginners, intermediates, and advanced artists. Its foundation is an acrylic polymer binder mixed with a zinc or titanium white, in addition to a calcium carbonate and a marble dust to keep the pores of the surface open so that your colors and paint can adhere to it. Gessos come in all sorts of colors and shades, including white, black, and gray. It also comes in a spray, but we're gonna stick to the liquid forms in this video. But you can also mix your own colors and values to meet your needs. Any powdered pigment can be added to an acrylic gesso, including any charcoal or graphite or an acrylic paint, but do not mix any oil-based product or paint. Oil and water simply don't mix. Let's quickly mix a couple of colors. This stage is really totally unnecessary, but it's some mild fun. Toning a ground for an image can sneak us into the creation faster or with more energy. Again, the real purpose of an acrylic-based gesso is to protect the fibers of the canvas from the acidic nature of the color, especially in oil paint. Like I mentioned earlier, it also creates a consistent, non-porous and smooth surface for our colors to glide across the canvas. But remember, everything is preference. There are a number of wonderful painters, including one of my favorites, Francis Bacon, that painted on raw canvas. As an artist, we just must be mindful of our process and our materials that sneak us into creation. Finally, if you choose to mix a color and create your own gesso, use an acrylic paint. It is far superior in low cost and mixing ability. Now let's jump over and demonstrate how to apply gesso. Prop up your canvas in order to easily paint the sides and to aid in the drying. Before gessoing, make sure your canvas is clean. Use some tape to remove all lint and dirt. Not to worry, any light stains will be covered up by the gesso. There are a number of brushes you can use to apply gesso. I don't recommend foam brushes. They really aren't durable enough and they tend to rip. A Japanese hake style brush is a great option. I would avoid your dedicated painting brushes. Gessoing will shorten their lifespan. Personally, my favorite is just an old hardware store house painting brush. 
The brush you pick should be at least two and a half inches to four inches to effectively cover the surface. Start by applying your gesso in the center of your canvas, working it outwards toward the edge. This will aid in the proper tightening of the fabric. Thus, it will dry evenly and rigid and avoid any low areas. Apply the primer in small amounts. With light to medium pressure, work the gesso into the fibers of the canvas. You will want a thin and even application of primer. Avoid high, built-up areas of paint. The fabric texture underneath still needs to come through. Being water-based, gesso dries fairly quickly, so you need to work rather quickly. And make sure you cover the whole surface in the one quick session. Once the front is covered, it's time for the sides. Again, with a nice and thin, even application. Finally, with an empty brush, go over the surface evening out any high areas, especially along the corners between the front and the sides. Then let dry. Once the first coat is dry, then lightly sand with a 220 grit sandpaper. This will help remove any extra marble dust, debris, or hairs that might have gotten stuck in the gesso from the brush. Starting with a dry brush, apply your second coat the same way as the first. For good practice, Avoid adding any extra water to your gesso. The extra water will weaken and possibly break down the binder. Always refer to the instructions that come on your gesso. The second coat is meant to seal up any openings that the first coat missed. Two coats of gesso will properly seal the surface. Any more than that is your artistic surface preference. Some artists like a faster surface that is smooth and feels like glass, while other artists like a rougher surface. Until you know your preference, I would recommend going with a smoother surface. See, there you go, exposed canvas, let's cover it. Again, using an empty brush, smooth out the entire surface before allowing to dry. Wait another 24 hours to allow to dry. Applying color or additional coats sooner weakens the bond. Once dry, sand the surface same as before. Now we can apply your painting or a third coat of primer. The more coats of gesso, the smoother the surface. Personally, I like three coats of gesso. Building your own canvases really do have their pros and cons. You have complete control over the entire process. You get to create the product you want. It will save you a lot of money in the long run. And you are an integral part of another aspect of the creation of that object. But it does take a lot of time to do it right. And it can be extremely frustrating when you're first learning how to do it. And now it's time to start another painting. I hope this helped. Thanks for watching, everyone. Nope, not over. I can't find my headphones. Scully said my headphones were out here. My headphones are clearly not out here. Sigh. Where are they? How am I supposed to listen to Survivor now without my headphones? Ow.